the British compared Cherokee society to their own from the viewpoint that British society was superior and was that of a civilized society. They viewed Cherokee society as the opposite of their own. Therefore, they viewed Cherokee society as inferior to their own and as uncivilized. And look at the British view of the Cherokee society during the mid 18th century, there were three primary sources used. The first is the report of William Gerald de Brom, which was prepared for George III in the early 1770s. He was a German surveyor cartographer with military experience who settled in Georgia in 1751. And he was hired in 1755 by South Carolina Governor James Glenn to see to the fortification of Charleston. And in 1756, Governor Glenn employed de Brom to build a fort on the Little Tennessee River, which was named Fort Loudon. It was during his time there, which was in the Cherokee Nation, that he penned his observations of the Cherokees. These observations, by the way, include what he calls a compendium of the Cherokee Indian tongue in English, which lists several hundred words in Cherokee with the English translation. So this is back from seven, early 1760s. So his observations give an excellent view of Cherokee society in the mid 18th century. And this was published, by the way, by the University of South Carolina Press in 1971. The second source is a letter dated February 1st, 1761 from William Fife, who's a Scottish doctor who settled at Georgetown, South Carolina. And it was written to his brother, John Fife, a merchant and banker of Edinburgh, Scotland. And it contains an excellent description of the Cherokee's manners, customs, troubles, etc during the late 1760 and early 1761. And it's among the collections of Gilcrease archives. And you could go online at Gilcrease and look at the copy of it. The third source is the memoirs of Lieutenant Henry Timberlake, who spent a few months living with the Cherokees in late 1761 and early 1762. And Timberlake, of course, is the person who accompanied the Cherokee leaders to London in 1762. And his memoirs give an outstanding view of Cherokee society in the mid 18th century. And Duane also edited this and in 2007 came out with a, an edition of this. And there are other older editions of Timberlake's journal. So one of the first views which the British had of Cherokees was as international trading partners. As early as 1708, about 50,000 deer skins were sent to England from the Cherokee nation. In the five year period from 1754 through 1758, approximately 150,000 deer skins were shipped to, from Charleston to England. And the majority of these would have come from the Cherokee Nation. And it does not account for deer skins that were sold to Virginia traders or that were shipped to other Northern American colonies. So the total number from the Cherokee Nation is likely much higher than the 150,000. With the difficulties between Great Britain and the Cherokees, these shipments from Charleston to England dropped to about 70,000 deer skins in 1759 and can continued to be low until the difficulties were settled in 1762. In 1763, the number for that year alone was more than 160,000. The deer skins were used by the British to produce a chamois-like leather that was used for gloves, book binding, and many other things. Deer skins were by far the major trade item of the Cherokees but however, other items made by Cherokees were also in demand. One of the major items was a split wood and cane baskets made by the Cherokee women. James Adair in the 1740s reported 
that they divide large swamp canes into long, thin, narrow splinters, which they dye of several colors and manage the workmanship so well that both the inside and outside are covered with a beautiful variety of pleasing figures. These baskets were sold in nests of up to eight or 10. Adair further states that they commanded a high price in Charleston where they were highly esteemed for their domestic usefulness, beauty, and skillful variety. I sh should have shown some more images of some of the more with better designs. So, but this is one example of Cherokee baskets. But for these trade items, the British traders exchanged various European manufactured items, excuse me, they exchanged various European manufactured items as listed by de Brom. And he has belts, leather with buckles, blankets, bracelets, silver and brass, bullets, calicos, combs, ear bobs, flints, garters, guns, hatchets, brass kettles, knives, linsey woolly, looking glasses, needles, pots, gunpowder, razors, silk ribbons, salt, scissors, shirts, thimbles, vermilion dye, and wire, both brass and iron. And since the Cherokees traded for these various items, they were considered to be without skills, notwithstanding their ability to supply the deer skins, baskets, and other trade items. Of five states, they have no trades among them. He does concede, however, that they are ingenious enough in carving and painting their bone tomahawks, etc., and are done very neatly. He further states, they live entirely idle during the winter months after their store is provided, at least their men do, for the women always find employment about works of agriculture, house matters, etc. So here we seem to have the advantage of them, for our tradesmen are equally diligent all the year round. But let's consider the motive. Among our laboring people to maintain their families or make money, which is avarice, are the motive, and how many of them, if they could support their families a, a year by six months labor, would be idle the other six. It's to our honor, though, that not satisfied with things barely necessary, we contrive and execute many different kinds of manufacture to beautify ourselves, houses, etc. The Indians do a little in, in this way by carving and painting their bows and arrows, calabashes, tomahawks, etc. So Fife believed that the British were industrious while the Cherokees were indolent. And Timberlake is a little more kind in his description of the Cherokees. He states, the Indians being all soldiers, mechanism can make but little progress. Besides this, they labor under the disadvantage of having neither proper tools or persons to teach the use of those they have. He further states that considering this disadvantage, their modern houses are tolerably well built. He goes on to say that their canoes are the next work of any consequence. They're generally made of a large pine or poplar from 30 to 40 feet long and about two broad with flat bottoms and sides and both ends alike. The Indians hollow them now with the tools they get from the Europeans, but formerly did it by fire. They're capable of carrying about 15 or 20 men, are very light, and canned by the Indians, so great in their skill in managing them, be forced up a very strong current. They have of late many tools among them, and with a little instruction, would soon become proficient in the use of them being great imitators of anything they see done and the curious manner in which they dress skins, point arrows, make earthen vessels and baskets for work are proofs of their ingenuity, possessing them a long time 
before the arrival of Europeans among them. Timberlake, who likely spent more time among the Cherokees than Fife, does give them credit for their ingenuity. And de Brom gives the following description of the Cherokee's housing. He says, the Indians build their houses of posts on which they lash in and outside canes and plaster them over with a white clay mixed with small pieces of talc, which in a sunshiny day gives to these houses or rather cottages a splendor of unpolished silver. They are about 12 feet wide and 20 or more long, covered with a clapboard roof, have no windows, but two doors on the opposite sides, sometimes only one door. The fireplace is at one end of the house with two bedsteads on both sides of the fire. The bedsteads are made of canes raised from the ground about two feet and covered with bear skins. Their corn houses are built in the same manner, but raised upon four posts, four and some five feet high from the ground. Its floor is made of round poles on which the corn worms cannot lodge, but fall through, and thus the Indians preserve their corn from being destroyed by the weevils a whole year. And two or more families join together in building a hothouse, about 30 feet diameter and 15 feet high, in the form of a cone with poles and thatched without any air hole except a small door about three feet high and 18 inches wide. In the center of the hothouse, they burn fire of well-seasoned dry wood and around the inside are bedsteads fixed to the studs, which support the middle of each post. These houses they resort to with their children in the winter nights. Upon the same plan of these houses, only on a greater diameter and perpendicular, their townhouses are built, in which the headmen assemble to consult in war, peace, or other concerns. And every evening during summer, all families of the towns meet to dance and divert themselves. Timberlake gives the following description of their houses. He states that their modern houses are tolerable, well-built. A number of thick posts is fixed in the ground according to the plan and dimensions of the house, which barely, excuse me, which rarely exceeds 16 feet in breadth on account of the roofing but often extend to 60 or 70 in length beside the little hothouse. Between each of these posts is placed a smaller one, and the whole waddled with twigs like a basket, which is then covered with, dry, with clay, very smooth, and sometimes whitewashed. Instead of tiles, they cover them with narrow boards. Some of these houses are two stories high, tolerably pretty and capacious, but most of them very inconvenient for one of chimneys, a small hole being all the vent assigned in many for the smoke to get out at. One thing on which the Brahm, Fife, and Timberlake agree is that the Cherokees were warriors. The Brahm gives a good account of the various military titles. He states that a certain number of scalps are required from the hands of a young Indian before he can be honored with the first military title, which is a slave catcher, and a certain number more for their next higher title, which is a raven. The next higher title to this is a man killer, which is as much as a colonel. Their highest military rank is that of a warrior or as much as a general. They receive at every promotion certain marks on their necks, cheeks, and breasts printed in the skin with scratching of a pen and gunpowder or coal dust before they have any title given them. They are only galled gunmen or boys, which in time of hunting and war attend their chiefs as servants, bring them water, wood, fire, and venison. A gang or troop take only one woman to war with them. She is to take care of the camp, fire, provisions, etc. This woman, after some campaigns, is raised to the dignity of war woman, to which all prisoners must be delivered alive without any punishment as her slave, if she requires it, which is a privilege no man can enjoy, 
not even their emperor, kings, or warriors. And there are but few towns in which is a war woman. Timberlake gives a similar description. He states that the people are divided into new military, two military classes, warriors and fighting men, which last are the plebeians who have not distinguished themselves enough to be admitted into the rank of warriors. There are some other honorary titles among them, conferred in reward of great actions. The first of which is Atasiti, or man killer, and the second, Kelona, or the raven. Old warriors, likewise, or war women who can no longer go to war but have distinguished themselves in their younger days have the title of beloved. This is the only title females can enjoy, but it abundantly recompenses them by the power they acquire by, which is so great that they can, by the wave of a swan's wing, deliver a wretch condemned by the council and already tied to the state. So this is all brought out in the Nanya he play. In five states that war is their principal study and their greatest ambition is to distinguish themselves by military actions. Even the old men or who are past the trade themselves use every method to stir up and martial ardor in the youth. Their young men are not regarded till they kill an enemy or make a prisoner. Those houses in which there's the greatest number of scalps are most honored. And Fife goes and gives an account of the ceremonies performed prior to leaving for war. He states, the day appointed for their departure being come, they take leave of their friends and change their clothes with their friends as tokens of friendship. Their wives and female relatives go out before them at some distance from the town and wait for them. The warriors march out dressed in their finest apparel and most showy ornaments regularly one after another, for they never march in rank, but always in a string like geese. The captain marches slowly on before them, singing the death song, while the rest are quite silent. When they come up to their women, they deliver them all their finery, put on their worst clothes, which is commonly a blanket and arse cloud, and proceed against their enemies. It is rarely about lands that quarrel for their lands are immense, but to keep up that barbarous bloodthirstiness which they think courage. Their military qualities are rather vigilance and hardiness than a courageous boldness, for they seldom fight in an open place. All their aim is to surprise and not be surprised. De Brahms gives a similar account of their method of fighting. He says that the Indians have as yet no notion of shutting themselves in forts, nor to fight without the greatest necessity in open fields. They lay in ambush and from behind trees fight their enemy and surprise them in their camps or houses early in the morning, taking the greatest care not to expose themselves to any kind of danger, if possible to avoid it. This method of fighting was in direct contract with or opposite to the European method of fight. Their soldiers lined up in rows and attacked the enemy in the open. The Brahms, Fife, and Timberlake all considered the Cherokees to be without laws. The Brahms states that although the Cherokees have an emperor, some kings, warriors, man killers, ravens, and slave catchers, all honorable titles and preferments suitable to the excellency of principles conceived by unrefined ideas bestowed on their headmen, yet they're without any legislator, of course, without law or government, nor do they pay any obedience unto their headmen unless when they go out upon a warlike expedition. Five says that their government is full of liberty. They can't be said to have any laws being guided by the customs of their ancestors. Without laws and punishments to force them, they adhere punctually what their fathers practiced before them. Our numerous laws enforced by punishments and joined to religion can't keep us in half the order they observe voluntarily. 
Timberlake states that their government, if I may call it government, which has neither law or power to support it, is a mixed aristocracy and democracy. The chiefs being chosen according to their merit in war or policy at home. These lead the warriors that choose to go, for there's no laws or compulsion on those that refuse to follow or punishment to those who forsake their chief. He strives, therefore, to inspire them with a sort of enthusiasm by the war song, as the ancient bards did once in Britain. These chiefs are headmen, likewise, comprise the assemblies of the nation, into which the war women are admitted. The reader will not be a little surprised to find the story of the Amazons not so great a fable as we imagine. Many of the Indian women being as famous in war and as powerful in the council. The British considered themselves to be a nation of laws, while the Cherokees were the opposite, a nation without laws. And interestingly, neither de Brom nor Timberlake make any reference to the clan system of the Cherokees. Fife mentions it, but confuses it with a family living together rather than the clan. He states, death is sometimes inflicted on them if a murderer kills one of the same cabin or family. The head of that cabin can put the offender to death. If the offenders of a different cabin, the heads of the nation are the judges. These cases, however, don't often happen. The common way is for the murderer to abscond and all his friend goes to the friends of the deceased and makes them presents. If the presents are accepted, the difference is made up. The person delivering the presents says, with this string of wampum, I remove the hatchet from the wound. With this belt, I'd stop the blood, as if by curing the dead person. But if the presents are rejected, the offender must be very cautious, or he'll be murdered, and then the offense is strong on the other side and desire of revenge the same. But they seem to have good inclinations, at least towards one another, for these quarrels are very rare among them. All three men commented on the Cherokees apparently lack of or scant knowledge of religion. De Brom states that the Indians have also but a very scant knowledge of a divine being, which knowledge or rather notion extends no further than that they believe he is good, but they pay no manner of adoration to him or anything existing or have to any ceremony at all, more than to extinguish all their fires once a year in July at the time when the Indian corn is in its milk, in which they squeeze out by beating and straining, then boil that milk by fire, new caught from electrization, which they perform with two green sticks, rubbed with great velocity against each other until they are lighted. When this milk is boiled to a consistency, they let it cool, then form it into little cakes, which they fry in bear's fat, and are, while warm, a delicious eating. With them, they keep feasting three days. To this season, they postpone all elections, promotions, and their king's coronation. De Brom further states that the Indians have a notion of immortality and of a future state where they expect to enjoy wives, guns, and large hunting grounds well stocked with deer. They have an apprehension of spirits. This they prove in such times when the warriors return from the wars with their scouts and expose them for several weeks before their townhouses. No woman, girl, or boy can be prevailed upon to go near the townhouse at night. They say among the scouts wander the spirits of the killed. These spirits the Cherokees call skina, which we know that that's also the Cherokee word for devil. five states religion they have very little of except such of them as the french make catholics of some of them have a confused notion of good and evil spirits but seem more attentive to avert the wrath of the latter than to apply it to the former he further says religion they know so little of 
that is no guide at all to them in their actions. This, I think, ought to enhance their virtues and lessen their vices. Then Timberlake has this to say about the church's religious views. As to religion, everyone is at liberty to think for himself, which flows a diversity of opinions amongst those that do think, but the major part do not give themselves that trouble. They generally concur, however, in the belief of one superior being who made them and governs all things, and are therefore never discontent at any misfortune because they say, the man above would have it so. They believe in a reward with punishment, as may be evidenced by their answer to Mr. Martin, who having preached scripture to both his audience and he were heartily tired, was told at last that they knew very well that if they were good, they should go up, if bad, down, that he could no more than he had long pledged them with what they no ways understood and that they desired him to depart the country. They have few religious ceremonies or stated times of general worship. The green corn dance seems to be the principle, which is, as I've been told, performed in a very solemn manner in a large square before the townhouse door. The motions here is very slow and the song in which they offer thanks to God for the corn he has sent them, far from unpleasing. And since Timberlake was only among the Cherokees from December to March, he did not observe a green corn ceremony. He did, however, observe another dance that he recorded. As I was informed, there was to be a psychic dance at night. Curiosity led me to the townhouse to see the preparation. A vessel of their own make that might contain 20 gallons, there being a great many to take the medicine, was set out on the fire around which stood several gourds filled with river water, which was poured into the pot. This done, there arose some of the beloved women who opening a deer skin filled with various roots and herbs took out a small handful of something like fine salt, part of which she threw on the headman's seat and part into the fire close to the pot. She then took out the wing of a swan and after flourishing it over the pot, stood fixed for near a minute, muttering something to herself. Then taking a shrub-like laurel, which I suppose was a psyche, or the physics, excuse me, she threw it into the pot and returned to her former seat. As no more ceremony seemed to be going forward, I took a walk till the Indians assembled to take it. At my return, I found the house quite full. They danced near an hour around the pot to one of them with a small gourd that might hold about a, a gill, which is about a half cup. It took some of the physic and drank it, after which all the rest took in turn. One of their headmen presented me with some and in a manner compelled me to drink, though I would have willingly declined. It was, however, made more palatable than I expected, having a strong taste of sassafras. The Indian who presented it told me it was taken to wash away their sins, so that this is a spiritual medicine and might be ranked among the religious ceremonies. They're very solicitous about its success. The conjurer, for several mornings before it is drank, makes a dreadful howling, yelling, and hollowing from the top of the townhouse to frighten away apparitions and evil spirits. According to our, our ideas of evil spirits, such hideous noises would be sympathy and call up such horrible beings. But I'm apt to think with the Indians that such noises are sufficient to frighten any being away but themselves. Timberlake also gives the following account of what he refers to as a religious ceremony. He says, the Indians have a particular method of relieving the poor, which I shall rank among the most laudable of their religious ceremonies. Most of the rest consisting purely in the vain ceremonies and superstitious romances of the conjurers. When any of their people are hungry, as they term it, or in distress, orders are issued out by the headmen for a war dance, at which all the fighting men and warriors assemble, 
But here, contrary to all their other dance, one only dances at a time, who after hopping and capering for near a minute with a tomahawk in his hand, gives a small hoop, at which signal the music stops till he relates the manner of taking his first scalp and concludes his narration by throwing on a large skin spread for that purpose, a string of wampum, piece of plate, wire, paint, lead, or anything he can most conveniently spare. After which the music strikes up, he proceeds in the same manner through all his warlike actions. Then another takes his place, and the ceremony lasts till all the warriors and fighting men have related their exploit. The stock thus raised, after paying the musicians, is divided among the poor. The same ceremony is made use of to recompense any extraordinary merit. This is touching vanity in a tender part and is an admirable method of making even imperfections conduce to the good of society. Fife makes a simple statement as to the Cherokee's care of those less fortunate than themselves. He says, if any of them are in want from a failure in their hunting, sickness, etc., the rest support them till next season. DeBrom, Fife, and Timberlake all viewed the Cherokees as being more physically fit than the British. DeBrom says, the author who had an opportunity to see many nations as Creeks, Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, and Catawbas, Uchis, and Yamases, never met with an Indian who was born a cripple, but observed them to be all well-made, tall and robust, neither very lean nor inclining to fatness. Of the latter, he saw in all only three, two men and one woman who were corpulent. All three were Creeks. Hmm. They all walked very straight, upright, and rather with stiff knees, which they secure, scarcely bend. The first and principal exercise of the Indians is bathing and swimming in which they're very dexterous. Every morning, immediately after rising, both in summer and in winter, coming out of their hothouses, they take their babes under their arms and leave their children to the rivers to which they enter, be it ever so cold. The mothers learn their babies swimming before they can walk, which generally increases their strength and, of course, their growth. They're very dexterous and nimble in their next exercise, which is wrestling, jumping, throwing and running, as also in their third exercise, hunting and shooting, both with arrow and guns. An Indian once kept up running afoot for three hours with the author who kept his horse in a constant gallop from Kiowi to Estowi and never left him. Fife says, that an Indian has black hair, straight limbs, and generally is taller than whites. They are hardy people, though their hardiness consists rather in bearing much exercise and labor. They're more robust and better made than we and have better and healthier constitution. This is owing to their temperance and exercise rather than our luxury and debauchery. It is evident our puny constitutions and short lives are owing to our luxury and debauchery. To please our palates, we eat unwholesome foods and are probably born of unhealthy parents by which our staminas are depraved. If we can be raised, we make our bad constitutions worse by our, our irregularities and then beget children a degree worse than we were. How many of us has coughs, rheumatism, gout, etc., or rather how few of us are free of some of these disorders. The Indians rarely know any of these, or indeed any chronic complaints owing to their exercise. Timberlake describes a foot race between some Cherokees and some officers of the Virginia Regiment. He says, there were three officers of the Virginia Regiment, the slowest of which could outrun the swiftest of about 700 Indians that were in place. But had the race exceeded two or three hundred yards, 
the Indians would then have acquired the advantage by being able to keep the same pace a long time together and running being likewise more general among them, a body that would always greatly exceed an equal number of our troops. The Brown gives the following description of the individual. The Indians have no distinction of dress among themselves, or do they seem to have a fancy for it, except it be in painting their faces with red in time of expressing their peaceful friendship and with black in time which they intend to indicate their warlike inclinations and ornamenting their hair, ears, and necks with feathers, garters, and beads, as also their arms with bracelets. If they have a blanket or a piece of shroud by them called a watch coat to hang about them as a mantle in the daytime, and to roll themselves in it as night, they are satisfied as they use very little to cover their body or head, for which they seem to take no manner of care, unless their legs and feet, which they always keep wrapped up in leather stockings or moccasins and woolen leggings. The men pull out their hairs, that is the eyebrows and beard, so that they appear as being born without the former and grown men without the latter, and therefore misled many Europeans to observe in their journals that the Indians have neither eyebrows or beards, and that by nature. Whilst they might have seen the women to have all very strong eyebrows, Fife essentially states that the men have no hair on their chin or lips, and both sexes shave it off their privities. Timberlake gives a more detailed account of their appearance. He says, the Cherokees are of a middle stature of an olive color, though generally painted, and their skin stained with gunpowder, pricked into it in very pretty figures. The hair of their head is shaved, though many of the old people have it plucked out by the roots, except a patch on the hinder part of the head, about twice the bigness of a crown piece, which is ornamented with beads, feathers, wampum, stained deer's hair, and such like baubles. The ears are slit and stretched to an enormous size, putting the person who undergoes the operation to incredible pain, being unable to lie on either side for nearly 40 days. To remedy this, they generally slit but one at a time. So soon as the patient can bear it, they're wound round with wire to expand them and are adorned with silver pendants and rings which they likewise wear at the nose. This custom does not belong originally to the Cherokees, but taken by them from the Shawnees or other Northern nations. They that can afford it wear a collar of wampum, which are beads cut out of clamshells, a silver breastplate and bracelets on their arms and wrists of the same metal, a bit of cloth over their private parts, a shirt of the English make, a sort of cloth boots and moccasins, which are shoes of a make peculiar to the Americans, ornamented with porcupine quills. A large mantle or match coat thrown over all completes their dress at home. But when they go to war, they leave their trinkets behind and the mere necessities serve them. The women with the hair of their head, which is so long, that it generally reaches to the middle of their legs and sometimes to the ground, clubbed and ornamented with ribbons of various colors. But except for their eyebrows, pluck it from all the other places of the body, especially the lower part of the sex. The rest of their dress has now become very much like the European and indeed that of the men in, is greatly altered. The old people still remember and praise the ancient days before they were acquainted with the whites, when they had but little dress except a bit of skin about their middles, moccasins, a mantle of buffalo skin for the winter, and a lighter one of feathers for the summer. The women, particularly the half-breed, are remarkably well-featured, and both men and women are straight and well-built with small hands and feet. They have now learned to sew by the way, it's in small hands and feet. My mother wore size four and a half shoe. 
they have now learned to sew, and the men as well as the women, excepting shirts, make all their own clothes. The women, likewise, make very pretty belts and collars of beads and warp and wampum, also belts and garters of worsted. Timberlake made an interesting observation as to the names of the Cherokees. He says, their common names are given them by their parents, but this they can either change or take another when they think proper, so that some of them have near half a dozen, which the English generally increase by giving an English one. From such circumstance in their lives or disposition, as the little carpenter to add a colacola, from his excelling in building houses, judge friend, or corruptly the judge, to Ostinoka for saving a man of that name from the fury of his countrymen, or sometimes a translation of his Cherokee name as Pigeon or Woya, thus being the signification or English translation of the word. And having done a bit of genealogical work among the Cherokee full blood families, I can certainly relate to Timberlake's comments. Many of the families are listed by different names on the various roles. My own grandfather had several names. His English name was Daniel Downing. His father was James Downing, whose Cherokee name was Kanuna or Bullfrog. And on the Dawes roll, my grandfather was enrolled as Daniel B. Frog, and with the B standing for Bull, since uh, he was the son of Bullfrog. Being an orphan, he was reared by his mother's cousin, Noah Sand. So my grandfather was often known as Dan Sands. And this, by the way, is my mother who's there with her father. And Timberlake has this to say about Cherokee marriages. He states, there's no kind of rites or ceremonies in marriage, courtship and all being, as I've already observed, concluded in half an hour without any other celebration and is as little binding as ceremonious. For though many last till death, especially when they're children, it is common for a person to change three or four times a year. Notwithstanding this, the Indian women gave lately a proof of fidelity not to be equaled by politer ladies bound by all the sacred ties of marriage. He then refers to the recent siege of Fort Loudon by the Cherokees. Many of the soldiers in the garrison of Fort Loudon having Indian wives, these brought them a daily supply of provisions, though blocked up in order to be starved to a surrender by there, that's the Cherokee women's own countrymen, and they persisted in this, notwithstanding the express orders of Willanawa, the Cherokee leader, who, sensible of the retirement this occasion, threatened death to those who would assist their enemy. But they, laughing at his threats, boldly told him they would succor their husbands every day and were sure that if he killed them, their relatives would make his death atone for theirs. Willanawa was too sensible of this to put his threats into execution. So as the garrison subsisted a long time on the provisions brought to them in this manner. And many of our che Cherokee mixed blood families descend from those alliances that were made with the soldiers of Fort Loudon. Indeed, even Henry Timberlake fathered a son during his short time with the Cherokees. And the Timberlake name is still carried by many in the Cherokee Nation to this day. And Fife sums up his observation of the Cherokees with the following comment. I think if the manners of the whites and Indians are compared impartially, the Indians and in the few things they know and practice act more reasonably than we. And I'm afraid that though we may be improving in knowledge, we are not making much progress in virtue or in reasonable actions. And he goes on to say that the more the Indians are connected with us, the faster it is observed that they decline. So for the most part, the British view of the Cherokee society it was that it was the opposite of their own. 
The British were civilized, the Cherokees were uncivilized. The British were a nation of written laws, the Cherokees had no laws. The British were religious people, the Cherokees had no religion. Nevertheless, the Cherokees considered the Cherokees and their society in high regard, as well they should. 